Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. Today we have a brand new Neville Goddard lecture. If you listen to We Are God Himself, at the end of that lecture, he tells the audience in the question and answer period, next week's lecture will be on the law. So I was excited to read that lecture. You can always tell what sort of lecture it's going to be if at the beginning... Neville says you'll find this very practical. That usually indicates that he's going to talk about the imagination and its power. This one's called The Invisible God Behind the Maid, delivered on October 27th, 1969. I think you will find this hour a very practical hour, and yet a very spiritual hour. We are told in the book of Romans Paul's letter to the Romans, the very first chapter, that all the invisible things of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. 120. So man is called upon to look at the maid and then to discover the invisible God. All of the invisible things of him are clearly seen. And how do I know? Well, I look at the things that are made and I begin to reflect upon what I did. For here I found myself in a world, and am I really responsible? I try to find out why. I look at all the things round about me, and finally I come upon a certain thought. You know when there was not a thing in the world to support my belief. I began to believe that one day I would experience this, and then I experienced it. So I relate the things seen to the unseen. Could that be God? Well now, Paul tells us in the very next verse, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Oh, I found the relationship between the thing seen and the unseen reality, the imaginal act, but I did not honor him as God. And then I turned to images resembling man, and I thought man on the outside was the cause, because he seemed to aid me in bringing this to pass. I turn and I exchange the immortal God for images resembling man. Or I might have turned to other images, that of a man. Not only a man, but that of a reptile, that of an animal, that of a bird. And I turn to these and think that they are the cause of my good fortune or misfortune. And I gave up the truth about God for a lie and began to worship and serve the thing created instead of the creator, for I could relate the outer world in which I lived to an imaginal activity within myself. Then I knew that that was the cause of it. For if God is the cause of everything in the world and I discover how it happened, and then I will not accept the fact I do not honor him as God. Read it in the first chapter of Romans from the 20th to the 25th verses. This wonderful revelation to all of us, for he's addressing us. This is not just for those to whom he sent the letter 2,000 years ago. It's to everyone who reads the letter. Stop for a moment and see if you can't relate the things around about you to something in you that caused them. And if you're perfectly honest, you'll see a cause in yourself. The cause was an imaginal activity. But then you will not, or I hope you will, But I mean, he said, But then they did not honor God as God. They did not honor him as God. They saw it, but did not in some way accept it. It was too great. And then they turned to man an image and turned to the created rather than to the creator. Tonight, let us see how we bring about these things in our world. The Bible begins on this note. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 1. He created the within and the without, and God dwells within. You are told that He created the heavens. Well, heaven is within you, we are told. Luke 17 21. He created the heavens which is within, and then He created the without. Now, how did He bring anything on the outside? We are told that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We find that motion was causative, that without motion it is impossible to bring forth anything, so God moved. Well, how does God move? 
We've discovered that he is our own wonderful human imagination, for I can relate what happens to me to my own imaginal act, so I know where he is. But now, how does he move? It is impossible to detect motion unless you have some fixed frame of reference against which motion moves, because motion can only be detected by a change relative to some other state. Well, what would I do now to move from not only where I am, but what I am, to that which I would like to be. Eyes can be open or shut, it doesn't matter. I'm doing it all in my imagination, so I imagine now that I am, and I name it. And it differs in what a moment before I thought myself to be. How do I know that I have moved? Well, I look at my world mentally and I must see a change. I must see that which implies that I have moved. I'll take it spatially first. If you are familiar with San Francisco, and here we are in Los Angeles, I put myself in Union Square in San Francisco. How do I know? Well, my eyes are opened, and I'm seeing the St. Francis Hotel. If I turn around, my back is to the St. Francis Hotel, and I'm looking towards the other side of the square. I go beyond it in my mind's eye, and I go down to Market Street. I feel that I'm there. Well, how do I know? Now think of Los Angeles. I think of Los Angeles and I see it 500 miles to the south of me. If Los Angeles is 500 miles to the south of me, I must be at least 500 miles north, but now I will locate myself in San Francisco by these familiar objects, and then think of Los Angeles and see it 500 miles to the south. Well, that's where I am. But I am told I can't be double-minded. Let not the man think that he will receive anything from the Lord if he's a double-minded person, for he's nothing more than simply a wave of the sea so that it is driven and tossed by the wind. James 1.8 So when I sleep this night, I must sleep as though I were in San Francisco, and as I am falling off to sleep, I must think of the place that I formerly knew, which is Los Angeles, and see it to the south of me 500 miles away, and fall asleep in that assumption that I actually am in San Francisco. That is in motion, and without motion it is impossible to bring forth anything. That is true of everything in the world. In the beginning God created the inner and the outer, and then the Spirit of God moved, and then creation began, so everything is within us. Everything is within us. But now how do I bring these things forward? Well, by the same simple, simple technique, I found that I did it, and it worked. I don't want to fall into that category spoken of in that first chapter of Romans, that although he knew God, he did not honor him as God. I found how it worked. I found that if I slept while in New York City, as though I were in Barbados, and to prove I was in Barbados, I thought of New York City and saw it 2,000 miles to the north of me. Then came a letter from my brother giving reasons justifying why I should come to Barbados, and then making it possible by enclosing a draft. In the letter he stated that if I would go to a certain steamship company that he had already written them and they would give me a ticket for Barbados, that I needed no money. The draft would take care of my normal needs aboard the ship and that I could sign for anything that I wanted if I used the bar, sign everything that I wanted, and he would meet me on the arrival and pay all expenses that I incurred on the trip. I did not write him to ask anything of him. He, at the same time that I was doing what I'm telling you that I did, he had the impulse to write me and give me reasons why I should come to Barbados, that I hadn't been there in 12 years and the family gathering at Christmas needed me to complete the link of the family. I was the only missing one of all the members, so his letter justified the draft, justified the expense that he would incur. And all that I did, I simply imagined that I was in Barbados. I didn't have a nickel, literally. Now, I know exactly what I did, and therefore I found God. For all things are made by God, and without him not a thing is made that is made. John 1, 3. So I found God. Am I going to fall into the trap now? that although I knew God, I did not honor him as God, and then turn to an image resembling a human being and say he was the cause of my trip, and give all credit and all praise to my brother, 
who sent me the draft and notified the steamship company to issue me a ticket so that I could come in and present myself and give proof of my identity and then get the ticket. So did I fall into the trap that he was the cause or did I remember the God that I discovered? That's what Paul is asking everyone who reads that letter. They found God and then they did not honor him as God. They found him and then they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. For to turn to see my brother as the cause of it, though he wrote the letter, I had set it in motion long before he wrote the letter. The one who set it in motion, he was causative. That was causation. So here, nothing is happening to us that we have not set in motion in our own wonderful human imagination. I tell you that you can be anything you want to be in this world. But when you voice your request and you say verbally, I want to be so and so, it must be a genuine desire and not something that you just flippantly say that I would like so and so. You must so want it that you're going to remain faithful to that change in position relative to a fixed frame. If you want to be other than what you are, well then, you can't just assume for one little moment that I am it, and then go back to your former state. Let not the double-minded man think for one moment he'll receive anything from the Lord as we are told in the book of James. Don't for one moment think that I can be double-minded and get anything from the Lord. I want to be successful in business. I don't care what the register told me today that I have and what I sold. I must sleep tonight as though it were all that I expected it to be, even though reason tells me it isn't and my senses deny it, but I've got to actually assume that all things are as I would like them to be, and then regardless of all the things round about me denying it, persist in that assumption. If I do it in this way, I cannot fail. This is the law by which we live in this world, so take it to heart. The God spoken of in Scripture is seated right here in everyone who is here, and He is your own wonderful human imagination. When you say, I am, that's God. Now, what are you imagining? If I could be so sensitive and I could feel your motion that now you dare to assume that you're other than what reason tells you that you are, and if I said, who has moved, and you answered, I would say, tell me who is now moving because I can feel it, and you would say, I am. Well, now, you've called his name. That's his only name. I am moving from where I thought I was to where I would like to be. I thought I was behind the eight ball and now I'm completely clear. Things are rolling just as I want them. I moved from where I was to where I would like to be and I detected the motion and wondered who is moving and then you replied, I am. That's God and all things are possible to God. So without the consent of anyone in this world, you simply move from where you are to where you'd like to be by a change of attitude. A simple change of attitude, but it has to be fixed. You move and then you fix it so that when you walk or when you sleep, that attitude is yours. For that state to which you most constantly return constitutes your dwelling place so that I constantly dwell upon this state. And in this state, that's where I live. And that's where I will return to no matter where I go in the course of a day. I go back to that state. Then that will externalize itself in your world. So all the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. How? By the things that are made. So when they come into the world, you recognize your own harvest. You are bringing them in anyway, but man is unaware of it. And he exchanges the truth about God for the lie. He exchanges the immortal God for an image of a mortal man. And because a man was instrumental in aiding you to bring it to pass, you think he was the one who did it, that he was the cause. He's not the cause at all. If tonight you inherited a fortune, don't think for a second the one from whom it seemed to have come was the cause of it. No, proceeding that you assumed it and he was the only instrument, the actor playing his part in giving it to you, a total stranger could be the one. You don't need a wealthy uncle, a wealthy aunt, 
a wealthy grandfather. I had it in my own family, a brother who, yes, he did befriend a friend, but certainly there was no reason for him at the end of his life to leave him the sum of money that he did, a considerable sum of money. He had a wife, and he had two sons and a daughter, and in his will he left it so that no one could break it. He said, I gave them all that I thought was due them, and then he left everything that he had to my brother Victor. And it was a considerable sum of money with all other things attached to it. My brother certainly was in his own mind's eye, assuming that he's a wealthy man. He kept assuming that I'm a wealthy man. That was his consuming desire, and there was no divided-mindedness in my brother. He wanted that more than anything in the world. He actually wanted it. To this very day, money to him is power, and he wanted power. He was tired of poverty, and he was tired of being shunted around, then dreaming power, just dreaming wealth, then out of the nowhere, people came and opportunities came. Well now, if he forgets the cause, he turns from the immortal God to an image resembling a man. That's what you'll read in that first chapter. And here he turns to a man and thinks that he was the cause of my good fortune. He gave me X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it wasn't that at all. He had to, or whoever it was, he's only one of numberless who would have to do it at the very spur of the moment, because someone is dreaming that he is wealthy. Though he has not a thing to support his dream, he is dreaming that he is. So I say to everyone, you can be what you want to be, but you can't be double-minded. You are told, let no one believe that looking into the mirror and turning away, forgetting what he is, that he will receive anything from the Lord. For the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So I say, well, I want it. And many a person will say to me, I want so-and-so. And you meet them a week later and they forgot they even told you. How could you forget? That was your request. And then ask me, where is it? This is not some little magical thing. This is based upon principle. You want it. You can have it. Are you willing to give up what you are to be what you want to be? That's the only price you pay for it. You don't make any sacrifice outside of giving up the state in which you find yourself to move into the state in which you want to be. They are only states. So here, without motion, it is impossible to bring anything forth, for everything is in the invisible world, but everything. Now how do I do it? I think of you, who would actually congratulate me if you heard good news about me and I bring you into my mind's eye and allow you to congratulate me. I know what this implies. The power is in the implication. What are you doing? You are congratulating me on my good fortune. I accept that congratulations and I don't duck it. I accept it as fact. That is my subjective appropriation of my objective hope because I am hoping that one day you will know of it and therefore you will congratulate me. So I go ahead in time and I go into that state and I allow you to congratulate me now. When you do it in the not distant future, then it is only confirmation of my imaginal act, but I will remember what I did and having done it, I will not forget what I did. Then I'll go about my business when I think of you. I will let you know in my mind's eye that you know of my good fortune. The day must come. It must externalize itself. So it externalizes itself. You will know of it. And you will congratulate me on my good fortune. So he brings things that are not seen into the world that is seen. As you're told in the same book of Romans, and God calls things that are not seen as though they were seen, and the unseen becomes seen. You'll read that in the fourth chapter the 17th verse of Romans, Catholic Bible KGV. He calls a thing that is not seen just as though it were seen and the unseen becomes seen. So what I call it. In this simple movement, I move from where I couldn't see it to where I could get a good look at it. Well, I can't see on your face any expression other than what I would now see if I knew my present condition. If I don't like that present condition, I want to see the same face, but I see it differently. Now, if I move from what I am into what I would like to be, 
I would still know you. You would still be my friend. So I bring you into my mind's eye and I let you see me as you would have to see me if things were as I want them to be. Then I don't move from that. I mustn't be double-minded and go back and let you see me in my former state. I must persist in this one state where you are seeing me. Now this is true of everything that you do in this world. I don't care what it is. If you want to be known, I don't care what the world will tell you. You may have not a thing in this world to show to the world that would cause anyone to look back at you and point you out as someone that is known. Forget that. You want to be known. You want to be rich. You want to be this. You want to be the other. Well then dare to assume that you are. For these assumptions, though at the moment you assume them, are denied by your senses. If you persist in them, they will actually become externalized. They'll become facts in your life. A friend of mine who is here tonight, and he's promised to write it out for me, but here he said to me, I started with $180 and I had so many debts, that's all that I had not so long ago in a small little restaurant in a small place, Ojai. Now he's contemplating an expansion into San Francisco. He said, tonight, Neville, the estimated value of my business is over $100,000. I know him well. I first met him in San Francisco and he heard this. He was born and raised an ardent Catholic. In his mind's eye, he is still a deep, deep Christian, but he does not call it Catholicism or Protestantism or any other ism, but he was raised in the Catholic faith. He heard this from me in San Francisco and he believed it. He began to apply it and things worked, but we forgot as he forgot. And then he remembered again, and then he forgot again. But now he has remembered, and I hope this time that the memory is permanent. So he started in this manner and everything fell into line. Yes, men came in to help. All these things happened, but they were not the cause. The cause of everything that happened to him was all in his own wonderful imagination. He would turn to his wife and say, what have we forgotten to do? We aren't applying this principle. So when things did not go as they should go, he remembered there was a law behind it all. Things are just not happening and they're happening only because he is creating them. Then he got back on the ball. Now here is this wonderful opportunity for expansion in the city of San Francisco and it all just happened. Today, they're all about to incorporate and the value is in excess of $100,000 and he started with $180. Now this is not too many years ago. So I say, everything in this world is possible to everyone if he knows who he is. If I asked the average person in this world, do you know God? And they were brutally honest. They would say, no, I don't. They speak of God, but Paul is not speaking of God. Paul said, and they knew God, yet they did not honor him as God. They knew God for they found that one day they imagined a certain state and something happened that was related to that state. Now you might have read in yesterday's paper or the day before yesterday's paper that this young lady, 25 years old, she reads all these papers and read the magazines. She saw the TV, heard the radio of all these murders of the young girls and she became frightened. She read of these many nurses in Chicago who were killed one after the other because they didn't cry out. She swore to herself she would cry out if it ever came to her life. And she took a knife and slept with a knife under her pillow for about two months. It was a knife. And she toyed with the idea of getting a gun. But she said, no, I wouldn't want a gun in the house. But she did have a knife. Then she put the knife back where it was in the sink area. Here the girl is working undoubtedly in a very nice job because she pays $160 a month rent so she must have a nice job then she heard a sound coming from the kitchen and she saw a shadow next thing she knew a knife was at her throat this tall blonde man with long hair to his shoulders about six foot two an estimated weight about 190 and he said to her how old are you she said 25 he said take off your pajamas and she thought this is it he's going to kill me all these things she had done and imagined in the past. And what 
she would do if it ever happened to her. So she had a knife, mind you, but she didn't have the knife this night. He had the knife. Then in some way, she got out of the bed by his order to take off her pajamas. She got the knife and began to stab him all over his back. Then he ran, leaving a trail of blood for at least a block. So she must really have done quite a job on his back. I don't see how he can avoid being detected. He has to go to some hospital or some doctor to be repaired. But everything she had imagined, having been exposed to TV, exposed to radio, exposed to all the things in the paper, came to pass. She may not relate it, but she did state that as she had read it in the paper that all these things she did imagine and put herself as the victim and what she would do even to the point of getting a knife to protect her. And it was a knife. It was not a gun. So not a thing happens in this world by accident. This is a world of law. The most horrible things had first to be imagined and the most beautiful things had first to be imagined. So everything is being imagined, good, bad, and indifferent. And these things are happening to us from morning to night. We have found God, as Paul said, the average person will say, no, I haven't found God. I never saw him. What does he look like? Well, didn't you see the phenomena? He tells you how you find him. All the invisible things of him are clearly seen from the beginning of time. How? By the things that are made. Well, that was made. That scene was made. Well, how could that be God? I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. I do all these things and none can deliver out of my hands. Deuteronomy 32, 39. That's God speaking. Not just some outside being. I kill, I make alive, I heal. I am the Lord and beside me there is no God. Well, do you say, I am? That's he. You mean I did all these things? Yes, I did all these things, good, bad, or indifferent, but I found him. So they found God. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Oh, I know that I imagined the thing, and then it happened, but don't tell me that is God, because that's not my concept of God. I have a different concept of God, something up in the sky, but certainly not here in my own imagination, because I am capable of all the unlovely acts in the world, and that could not be God. But they did not read their scripture. If they read the scripture, they would hear the same God saying, Kill, although I make alive. I wound and I heal. Well, who is stabbing a person? She said, I am. Well, that's God. That's his name. His name is I am. Who held the knife? I am. That was a person. And he was imagining all things too, for he had imagined that suppose I'm not successful, what are the consequences of my act? He had imagined that too. So the whole vast drama is unfolding of God within man. And there's only one God that is God. If you really have a desire, but it must be a genuine desire. So when you voice the wish, it is not just an idle wish. It must be something that is so genuine that you mean it. Then I'll tell you how to get it. You simply move from where you are mentally, not physically. People do all things on the outside. You don't do it that way. You do it on the inside. What would the world look like if you were now the person that you want to be? What would it look like? Well, see it that way. If you see it that way, you have moved from where you were to where you would see it, as you would see it if it were true. Well, now, what would you see? Then move. The motion is all mental, all in your imagination, but it must be genuine. If it's genuine, you remain in that state. Don't go from place to place. Just remain there into whatever house you go. Remain, he said. Just remain in it. So I'll go into a state and I remain in that state regardless of what the world will do. If I remain in it, I will bring it into visibility. But it is impossible without motion to bring anything from the invisible state into the outer visible state. You can do it. Everyone can do it because you have an imagination and that is God. That is God in you. And without him, not a thing is created. 
Whatever is created is created by God, whether it be good, whether it be indifferent, whether it be an evil thing. So take me at my word, my friend is here tonight, and I've asked him to write the story up for me in detail, which he promised to do. But to start with $180, and that is not $180 clear as he had debts, all kinds of debts, in trying to make a little restaurant go. Then from there, to suddenly find it growing and growing, and out of the nowhere someone comes down from San Francisco and said, you know, this is my third visit here, all the way from San Francisco, because this is what San Francisco used to be. And now it's all tourists, all sophisticated. This is the real old San Francisco way of dining. Then he proposed that he come to San Francisco. He'll find him the place and he'll incorporate and do all these things. Then the present value of this today is a hundred odd thousand dollars from an investment of $180, which is not really $180, because he didn't have any money and he had so many debts. Now he said tonight, I have the pink slip of everything in my restaurant. There is not one penny owed on anything in the restaurant, and I have the best material, the finest, most modern equipment, and everything I hold the pink slip by simply applying this. So I don't ask him how you were born. He was born in a very devout Irish Catholic family in Boston. His family is gone from this world, but he went as a devout Catholic. His mother is still here, and undoubtedly she's a devout Catholic. They love him as a son, but undoubtedly before the father left, he wondered, and the mother wonders, what happened to my son? But he found God, and they are not yet. They found him. But they don't believe that he's God, because no one can live a full, ripe life and not at some time find a thing happening in their world and cannot see the relationship between what they imagined and what has happened. They refuse to believe that they are causative. They can't believe that this is the cause of the phenomena of life, and so they will ignore it and brush it aside, but they found God. As he said in his own words, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God and exchanged the immortal God for an image resembling man and exchanged the true knowledge of God, all that they knew about God, for a lie. Then they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. The creator is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. If you are in control of what you are imagining, not a thing in this world is impossible to you. But you will find that when you find God, your values will change. You will not worship things. You will worship God the Creator. You'll be so thrilled when you can imagine something for a friend and see it work and then give thanks to the one that did it all within you. So you thank God and you worship God and you serve God when your friends give you the good news and it confirms what you imagined for them. You are thrilled and you honor God. You thank the friend for bringing the good news for you knew it had to come someday for you had imagined it. Therefore, thank him. But the real thanks goes to God for you have found him. And now, you honor God because he never lets you down. You don't have to burst a blood vessel to make it so. You let it be so. You knew the request was a genuine request. The man wanted this, the lady wanted that, and these wanted so and so, and you simply imagined it and trust him implicitly to do it. It was not based upon your moral code, your ethical code. No, just your trust in God that he would do it. So you knew that what you had imagined was God in action and that God is faithful. Therefore, it would come to pass in a way you could never devise. So you couldn't tell them what to do to aid the birth of it. You only knew that you did it and therefore it had to work. So I ask you who are in business, who have, if you're not in your own business and you want to transcend what you are, imagine that you have. Don't ask yourself, if you are qualified, you will be qualified. All that it takes you will get. All that it takes to fill the better job will come to you. The know-how will come to you. You simply assume that you are the man, the woman that you would like to be. Then, in a way that no one knows, it is going to take place. Your businesses will grow. Your family will grow. And all these things will grow just as you 
have imagined it. So when you read that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep, you'd know who He is. He is your own imagination, and it moves. You can stand perfectly still and move. And may I tell you, you can so move that you can be seen spatially at the point in space where you have imagined that you are. I've done it. I'm speaking from experience. 2,000 miles away, I appeared to my sister, for I wanted her to see me, and yet physically I was in New York City in my own home. I wanted her to see me, and she came in and she saw me. She could not see what she ought to have seen with her physical eyes. She should have seen her son, but she couldn't see her son. She could only see her brother Neville, for that's what I wanted her to see when she looked at her son. Here I am physically in New York City, and yet to my sister in Barbados, across water, and how did I move? I simply moved in my imagination, and yet in Barbados she saw me. Then she sat down and wrote me and said, Neville, the strangest thing has happened to me. I went into the room to look at Billy, and I couldn't see Billy. I only saw you. I rubbed my eyes. I did everything, and no matter how I looked, I couldn't see Billy. My son was not there. It was you. Will you please explain it to me if you can? At that very moment, I was doing what she said that she saw and witnessed. And when I came out, I told my wife and told a friend who was waiting for me to come out of my bedroom exactly what I had done. Eight days later came a letter from my sister asking if I could throw some light on this strange thing that had happened to her. Had I told it eight days before, then they might have believed me afterwards, yes, but there would have been a question. But they could not deny that I told them eight days before what I had done. It came not by air, because in those days you couldn't get a letter by air, so it came by boat. It took eight days to bring that letter. I tell you that all things are possible to man because God and man are one. So you'll find this night a very practical night. And yet, you'll find it a very spiritual night. You take it, but you must be sincere in your wish so that you're not moving from place to place. Do you really want and you name it? You want a glorious home? Don't say, well, I can't afford it. Do you really want it? then sleep in it as you will conceive it. Do you want this, that, or the other? Well, then sleep in it as though it were true, and that's your motion. You move from where you were into where you want to be, but remain there. When you rise in the morning and the world tells you that you're not there, you simply walk through the door just as though you were. You're leaving that place, and in that state you remain. And then everything happens. If it takes the entire world to aid it, the entire world will aid it. It took a man to come from San Francisco three times to enjoy a meal, a wonderful meal. But it's not an extravagant meal, but a tasty meal. The kind of environment that he said old San Francisco used to have. He lived there for 30 years. And he said, this is the kind of place we always had in old San Francisco. The decor the atmosphere, the food, everything about it. Now today all the restaurants have gone into catering to tourists and that old atmosphere has gone and I would like to rebuild it, at least in one place. I tell you that when we open, we'll turn away everyone outside because we'll have so many of the local people coming and they'll come only by reservation. You'll have no extra room for outsiders. So I asked him to save me a spot anyway. Coming from LA, I know he will. So take me at my word, it is impossible without motion to bring anything into this world and the motion is all within you. The motion is a simple motion, all you do. You know exactly what you want. Well, if you had it, how would you see the world? If you see it as you now see it, you haven't moved. If you see it as you would see it after the result, then you've moved. Now continue seeing that For motion can be detected only by a change of position relative to another object. If I say I am moving now and I see everything as it is now, then I haven't moved. But if, as I move, I look at the same frame of reference and I see it from a different angle, then I've moved. So I use as a frame of reference my friends, your face, and on your face, I let you see me as you would have 
to see me if you knew of something that you do not know now. You have to see me differently if you heard news of me that is not now known when you meet me the next time you would see me differently if that's what i want you to know then let me see on your face the expression that would imply that you know of that news if you would be one who would congratulate me on that news then let me accept the reality of your hand and the reality of your voice and the words coming congratulating me having done that let me know that was true and let me have faith in this unseen reality if i do no power in the world can stop it they can't stop it if man only knew this he'd be free really free but today he doesn't know the source of the cause of all things that happen in this world he doesn't know causation he doesn't know the cause of phenomena and he thinks the president is doing it or the army is doing it or the Pentagon or something on the outside, his competitor is doing it. Not a thing is doing anything but what is taking place within him in his own wonderful human imagination. In the deep depression of 1929, we only hear of the hundreds of thousands who lost everything on paper in the stock market. For in those days you put up 10% and even then you didn't have to the way they manipulated it. So if you were wiped out and you say you are wiped out of a half million all on paper, you didn't have it at all. But there were others who made fortunes, so we read only of those who lost. But we do not read of the tens of thousands of men who became multimillionaires, because all stocks. I read in this morning's paper that RCA dropped from this fantastic height down to $11 and found no buyers. And the boy on this floor, just as a joke, bid $1 for a block of stock at $1 and got it. There were no takers, and he got it at $1 a share. Whether he could raise a few dollars to buy them, I don't know. But it kept on tumbling all the way down, and they thought at $11, it couldn't possibly go lower. Then he put in a bid at $1 a share, and it fell to him, because there were no takers. If he held on to it, and it has been split and split several times, what would that little boy who ran errands on the floor be worth today but he was only one of that kind there were those who had cash and they took advantage of it all and they simply bought it it tumbled and all stock lost 70 percent of their value so there were those who could buy but i'm not going into that side of it i'm just saying if you remember god and god is not on the outside god is on the inside and he's your own wonderful human imagination he brings everything into being by moving so he moves from one state to another state he remains faithful to that state until which he goes and then whatever is there must project itself on the screen of space and bear witness to his creative power so all the invisible things of him are clearly seen from the very creation of the world through the things that do appear so they appear and you know exactly what motion he made. When this appears, that's the motion that he made, or it could not appear. If depression appears, that's the motion he made. If the papers begin to suggest to you that things are going to be on the way down, and you accept it, then you'll move, suggested by a paper, magazine, or some so-called expert, and then it will appear. It appears because you moved based upon some suggestion by what you thought to be an authority. And it isn't that at all. It's all within you. If you ignore the suggestions and do not accept them at all and keep on moving where you want to be, well then, you'll move. And if you remain in it, it will externalize itself in your world. But you'll find this the practical night, and yet you can't divorce it from a very spiritual night because you found God. What is more than finding God, and God is your own wonderful human imagination. The day will come you'll find him in a more wonderful way by the series that i've spoken about night after night which we'll pick up again because that is to me far more important but nevertheless one should know who they are while they are here that you're not a victim of circumstances you are not a victim of people on the outside you are god and there is no other creator but God. 
There is no other Savior but God, and God is one. He's not another, and He is you. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence, followed by questions and answers, as we will do now. Now let us go into the silence. Now, are there any questions, please? Well, above all things, apply what you heard and then share the results with me. Don't give me anything, but tell me the story. That's gift enough. I don't mean that you apply it toward a fortune and then share your fortune with me. No, I'm not asking for that. But to tell me the story is enough. That is a gift, for I love to hear the story. I love to hear your dreams and your visions. So until the next time, Thank you. And that concludes the invisible God behind the maid. This is definitely one of my favorite lectures on imagination, and it covers some important points. First of all, that motion is important when using the imagination. And you don't have to actually move anywhere, but motion within your imagination. And that is the central location where you are imagining. And I find this to be a super powerful technique. When you go on vacation and you go to sleep on vacation, you think of your home spatially, like my home is to the west of me, my home is to the north of me. Maybe it's a little thought, but there's this part of you that sort of geolocates itself. And so if you want to go on vacation to Bora Bora, then you would imagine going to sleep in Bora Bora and you'd recognize the direction where your house is. You get a mental placement of your house. You would put yourself in that place. So if you want to go to Mount Rushmore, you stand before Mount Rushmore and you think of your house in another place. This also works for time, not just place. So when you say, I remember when this happened, you're placing yourself into the future and then spatially looking back on it as if it's already occurred. I remember when I was poor and you look back on that from a location and that movement is essential. Motion is essential. He emphasizes that you must have a genuine desire and not something that you just flippantly say that we'd like to have so-and-so, but a genuine desire. And you must want it so that you're going to remain faithful to that change in position relative to a fixed frame. If you want to be other than what you are, you can't just assume for one little tiny moment that I am it 
and then go back to your former state. He's emphasizing the process of this technique. He says, let not the double-minded man think for one moment he'll receive anything from the Lord. Don't for one moment think that I can be double-minded and get anything. I want to be successful in business. I don't care what is being told around me. I must sleep tonight as though it were all that I expected it to be. Here we get an idea that you can't imagine for 10 minutes and then go about your life imagining something different. You must carry this into your everyday life. This must be the home that you return to. This must be the place that you continue to go back to. Yes, the imagination creates everything. That includes the evil, as he tells of the story of the woman who was watching the news and was worried about a man coming into her house, so she carried the knife next to her pillow and thought about it all the time, and the man came into her house, and she was able to stab him, that whole story. Now, as a side note, I do say for my good friends that are into crime shows, which there are so many great ones on Netflix and other streamers and Dateline and all those shows, if you're always watching those shows, they can be creative on some level. I am sure of it. There are stories now in the news where people ha had been obsessed watching crime shows and now are getting caught up in crimes themselves or victims of crimes. And as somebody that's had a home invasion and has gotten caught up in it, I know. So I'm telling you, this girl was thinking about it all the time and it was because of her imagination. I know this is a fact. Recently, I was given verification of this fact on a previous episode where I talked about how nature is talking to you. I mentioned that I had these baby doves outside of my office window and I had a new batch of baby doves born and I posted a picture of them and I got up and I was just looking at them so lovingly and I started to worry, oh, something terrible could happen to these baby doves. They could be eaten by a cat or something terrible like that. And then the next day, we always checked on the doves and the doves were not there. We had seen them in the morning when we looked out the window. So they had been there in the morning and there was no way they weren't ready to fly yet. And we found one of their little baby bodies mangled. Clearly a cat had gotten to them and I had seen it all in my imagination. Imagination is so powerful. So we have to constantly remind ourselves that what we are imagining is becoming reality. And if you hear the story of Neville's brother, that is a state that we can enter. I believe it's the state of Victor. His brother wanted to be wealthy and focused on his wealth. He even had friends that died that had families that left him money. He had a very successful business and was very wealthy. And that is the state of Victor. And we can see that in the world. When I've been in the state of Victor, great wealth has come my way. This is an important episode that I would put in the prosperity mindset playlist because it is key to understanding you constantly clothe yourself within the idea that you are what you want to be, that you are wealthy and it comes to you. We have some very interesting examples here. Somebody that only had $180 and was deeply in debt was able to imagine themselves out of that situation and have all their debts paid and own a restaurant and be looking to expand, be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is a new story that we haven't heard before from Neville, so I was excited to hear it. You might be sitting there with $180 in the bank. I just want you to know, no matter where you're at or what your situation, if you can escape from your senses and what you are aware of in this present moment and move yourself to a place of security and prosperity, of happiness and joy, if you can feel it, if you can see it on the faces of those around you, if you can hear it, if you can enter into it and imagine and daydream yourself into that state, that you will see it in your world. Go to sleep with it. 
go to sleep with this wonderful ideal no matter where you're at in the world and it may not come right away you cannot live doubly you have to continually imagine it and if people say you're insane ignore them ignore what anybody says about your world knowing full well that it will happen for you and it will this is a very practical lesson as neville indicates you have this power and anything is possible in this world for you so embrace it understand it it comes from that i am that universal mind within you you never know how it's going to work out you have no clue in your mind the ways in which this mind this wonderful imagination within you brings about this thing in your world it's so much fun to watch it you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution <laughs>